the skies of Bethlehem appeared a star. While angels sang to lonely shepherds, three wise men seeking truth, they traveled from afar, hoping to find the child from heaven. Falling on their knees, they bow before the humble Prince of Peace. I bring an offering of worship to my King. No one on earth deserves the praises that I sing. Jesus, may you receive the honor that you're due. The honor that you're due. Oh, Lord, I bring an offering to you. cannot compare to the glory of your love. There is no shadow in your presence. No mortal man would dare to stand before your throne, before the Holy One of Heaven. It's only by your blood, it's only through to my King. No one on earth deserves the praises that I sing. Jesus, may you receive the honor that you're due. The honor that you're due. Oh, Lord, I bring an offering to you. I bring an offering of worship to my King. No one on earth deserves the praises that I see. Jesus, may you receive the honor that you're due. The honor that you're due. Oh, Lord, I bring an offering to you. We bring an offering to you. are an offering to you. An offering of praise we sing. An offering to you. We are an offering to you. An offering of praise we sing. An offering to you. to our King. No one on earth deserves the praises that we sing. Jesus, may you receive the honor that you're due. The honor that you're due. Oh, Lord, we bring an offering to you. Oh, Lord, we bring an offering to you. I bring an offering to you. Well, let me uh, invite my readers, the Hines family, joining us today. Andy and Aubrey and Avery are going to be my readers this morning. So we're going to invite them up here. And uh, while they're coming, we are unpacking the third in the series, Unto Us. The first week we uh, talked about we talked about our wonderful counselor and then the mighty God, this week everlasting Father. There is a verse in chapter 9, verse 2, that I, I want to read. It says, and we've talked about those little, those little glimmers of hope throughout the, uh, the first 39 chapters where Isaiah gave these little glimmers of hope. Verse 2 of chapter 9 is one of those where he said, The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of the shadow of death, upon them a light has shined. 
Now, we're going to take three passages of scriptures, one from the New Testament, one from the end of the Old Testament in our, in our uh, uh, feature verse, if you will, in just a moment. We've got some wonderful readers. In Luke chapter 2, uh, we're going to hear from Aubrey first. So Luke chapter 2, verses 8 through 20. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. Ye shall find him, find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. Thank you. And suddenly there were with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. And it came to pass as the angels were gone away from them into heaven. The shepherds said one to another, Let us now go even unto Bethlehem, and see the thing which has come to pass which the Lord hath made known unto us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told to them concerning this child. And all that heard it wondered at all these things which were told to them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all of these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told unto them. Amen. Thank you. Now, that, notice the, the emphasis, if you will, kind of a, uh, a, a, a powerful expression where it's good news of great joy to all people. And then at the end of the Old Testament, the book of Malachi, two verses before 400 years of silence from heaven, two verses that give a, another glimmer of hope. Listen. Malachi chapter 4, verse 5 and 6. See, I will send you the prophet Elijah before that great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers. Or else I will come and strike the land with a curse. Amen. And our focus verse for this whole series, Isaiah 9, 6. Isaiah 9, 6, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Very good. Very good. Show your appreciation of this wonderful family. Thank you all. Merry Christmas. <clears throat> I have been uh, struggling somewhat this week and prayerfully approaching this, this passage of Scripture with uh, a lot of tears and a lot of reflection for different reasons. Um, I don't know. You've, you've received those or seen on Facebook where you click and you see where dads or moms come home from the military and they surprise. Doesn't that just make you bawl like a baby? And, I, and I've watched some of those to hear, hear a child cry out, Daddy, and, and Dad. And I've been thinking about these, these passages, what we're looking at. And um, remember, Isaiah began in chapter 1, after we met Isaiah, remember we met him, and, and there was this description of the, the years that he had ministered in. We talked about how many years he ministered and who he ministered to, the culture he was ministering in. And then the second and third verse of Isaiah 1 say this, Hear, O heavens, give ear, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. Hear this, I have, just as that last passage in, in, in Malachi talks about fathers and sons, God says here in Isaiah, I have nourished and brought up children and they have rebelled against me. The ox knows its owner, and the donkey its master's crib, but Israel does not know. My people, my people do not consider. Unto us is born an everlasting Father. Let's quickly look at the phrase everlasting Father this morning. And 
and just kind of absorb what he is like. He is, he is like, um, what is he like? He's compassionate. He is compassionate. And in fact, that, that terminology of father, and we'll get to that in the, in the New Testament, the word Abba, the word daddy. There is a tenderness, a gentleness. In fact, it's described as a, uh, uh, to treat as a darling child, a sweet child, a precious child. That's how God looks at us. Not as a, as a mean-spirited old ogre on a throne. No, He's a tender, loving God. And He's described for us as an everlasting Father with tenderness in His heart. What compassion He's shown me in my life. I've been treated like a son, not like a, a criminal, and not like a slave, but his desire is to treat me like a child and you like a child because that's what he's like. That's what this everlasting father is like. He's also gracious. We don't get what we deserve. He doesn't treat us like we should be treated or how we deserve to be treated. He, he bends down. He stoops down. I've... For every child, or for every grandpa and grandma and dad and mom, when a baby comes, Spencer, my little grandson. Have I told you I've got grandchildren? When Spencer comes to me and he reaches up and he'll, he'll his, his phrase is "need you, need you, need you, Papa, I need you, Papa." Well, let me tell you, I don't care where I'm at or what I'm doing. When he needs me, I'm reaching down toward him, and that's that's the picture. Of God reaching down graciously, loving us and picking us up and holding us. That's what He's like. He's compassionate. He's gracious. He's, he's patient. Oh, I'm glad. Aren't you glad God's patient? I'm so thankful that He's patient. Oh, how I've put Him off. Oh, how I've made Him wait. Oh, how I've said, no, in a little bit I'll get to it. But He is patient and he is loving, he is compassionate, he is, that's what he's like. That's what this everlasting father is like. Now it's hard, very hard for us to, to get our minds around this in the context that it's given to us in. To, to help us understand, I reached out to a dear friend, uh, Yuri Goldflam, who is um, an archaeologist, he's a teacher, a lecturer, he's a He's a guide in Israel, and I met him a few years ago, and so I bounced things back and forth. Off. And I heard him talk about fatherhood and father in the, in, in the context of Israel, and, and I, was, uh, I was struck by the difference between how we look at fathers and how that part of the world looks at fatherhood. In fact, it's interesting, the Jewish culture, how Jewish fathers talk to their children. I don't know if you have any Jewish friends or you're around Jewish people, but there is something about Jewish fathers and, and their children. They're always speaking good. He's a good boy. You're a good boy. You did well. There's always that affirmation that is spoken into the life of a child. Now, in that culture, it, the, the difference, what I'm trying to get to, is that in, in our culture, in, in the Western culture, uh, here, father and son is seen very differently. We think individualistically. We have this rugged individualism in our culture. We're our own person. We're our own man. We are a self-made person. And in the, in the Eastern culture, it's not that way. It's, it's corporate thinking. It's thinking as a unit, as a tribe. Someone explained it this way. In the West, it's individual. In the East, it's collective. In the West, it's self. In the East, it's my family, my group, my tribe. In the West, we're shaped by our personality and identity and our individual interests. In the East, they are shaped by others. In the West, we value uniqueness. In the East, they value uniformity. In the West, attention is to be sought, pursued, and valued. In the East, attention is to be devalued. In the West, I am my own person in the East. I belong to a group in the West. It's about my contribution I make to society in the East. It's about our corporate, our contribution. In the West, it's my opinion. In the East, it's what does the group or the tribe or my family think. 
Totally different from our perspective as father. It's, a, uh, it's like when a, in, in the picture of the, the king, Jesus talks about the, the king sending his son at a certain point in the New Testament. This picture of, uh, wow, I just kind of exploded there. Didn't I? Uh, the king sending his son to represent him to a group of people and then how that they mistreated the son. And in, in that way of thinking, what is done to the Son is done to the Father. The only thing I think we can connect that to in our way of thinking is in the United States, we have ambassadors to every nation. We have a piece of sovereign territory in every, in every nation. By the way, in Israel, it's now going to be Jerusalem. Isn't that cool? And so uh, it, wherever it's at, it's sovereign territory. And the ambassador to that nation, if you do something to him, that's why Benghazi was such a big deal. If you do something to him, you do something to the whole nation. That's... That's really the only thing I can bring up or, or kind of help us to understand uh, what, how deeply that value is held. It's, it's what's true in national life is, is true in family life. Someone said Jesus is the visible representation of the invisible God, the Father. That's why the word Father is so important. That's why I, Isaiah was given that word to help us understand who God is. The scripture writers highly value the word Father. It's one of the deepest of all human relationships. In weddings, I, I, I try to tell families, and especially when I'm counseling families uh, that are getting married, I don't just talk to the, the children, but I talk to the parents as well. Now that you're now that they're getting married, they're they're your child, but it's their home. Uh, you have certain things you can say, and then there are things you can't say. It's their home. It's their life, and try to re, reboot their understanding of that relationship between a child and a parent. However, however, there is nothing like, regardless of how old you are, there is nothing like the admiration or the affirmation or the approval the heart of a child from a parent nothing more powerful than that in my life i i've i you know i've said this to you before if you all got mad at me and turned your back and didn't like me anymore and and i went home and and terry kissed me and said i love you and everything's going to be all right well i'd be fine because of the value that is attributed to that relationship. And it's, it's the same with our parents. Regardless of where we go as, par as, as children, it means something to grab that, that, uh, that approval from our, a parent. That's why, that's why gangs flourish, because children, especially boys, need that affirmation. They need someone to follow. They need someone, a, a figure, a father figure that gives them their identity. That's why they flourish. I think I've shared this before, the, the story of Paco, a young boy in Spain, in Madrid, who wanted to be a bullfighter, and his dad did not want him to be a bullfighter because that was a very dangerous profession, and they fought and they quarreled, and he left, and the dad wanted to try to reach out and rebuild the relationship, and there in Madrid, there's a newspaper called the El Liberal, and he wrote an advertisement, put it in the paper, Paco, meet me at the Hotel Montana at noon on Tuesday, all is forgiven, love Papa. And when he showed up, there were, and Paco is a very familiar name in Spain, there were 800 Pacos. <laughs> Why? Because they wanted that affirmation, that love from their father. I have watched grown men weep as they have told me about the first time that their dad said to them i love you the power of that relationship now let me say something and what i'm about to say here in this part of the sermon is something that we have prayed over this week because i want this to be meaningful to everyone in this room but I realize that the word father emotes different emotions in different people. I realize that. For some, you have a father, a loving father, a very supportive father. You have that relationship, and it's precious, and, and you've got that. For some, you had a loving father, and he's gone to heaven, and, and, and you don't have that relationship, though it's wonderful in, in your memory. Some have lost their father at an early age and never really got to know their father. Some were abandoned or separated from their father. 
never had the relationship that others have had. For some, Father is, is a guy that was there, but he wasn't there. He wasn't there. He, wasn't, he was present physically, but he wasn't present emotionally. He was kind of detached. And for, for, for some, in every crowd and in every setting, there perhaps are some who have, have been abused by a Father. And I understand all of that. So when you hear the word everlasting father, it's hard to handle. It's hard to to process that. It's hard to get your mind around that. This is what I'm asking everyone in this room and everybody that's watching me today. I'm asking each of us. I, I want us to experience a reset or a reprogramming if necessary, if it's needed. A reset in your mind of understanding, not of the word father, or even about your experience with that word Father, but an understanding of who this Heavenly Father is. That we can see Him clearly and purely. And as I said, this is important because people have been praying for this very moment. That this will be what you will hear. And regardless of what past experiences you have, from this moment on, when you hear the word Father, you'll think of this Heavenly Father that Isaiah speaks to us about. In, in, in the Scriptures, God's portrayed in different ways. He's portrayed as a, as a husband in Hosea. Uh, uh, but mostly, it's, it's, a, it's a father. And when we look at the word Father, there are some things that we see that a father does. Because one of the first things that I, that's meaningful to us that a father does is that he forgives. And I'm glad that he forgives. There's nothing more important. I've, had, I've asked my father to forgive me in the past, and I know how important that is. When Terry and I first got married, my grandpa, my dad's dad, gave us um, a few cast iron skillets. And that's back when I ate fried potatoes on a regular basis. And, um, and, and I remember Terry and I, when we first got married, she had left it. I don't know how it got outside, but it got outside for some reason. And it got wet. And sitting on a back porch, I would imagine, it got wet and got all rust, and she was so tore up. She was afraid, because he had got that for us, and she was so afraid of how he would respond. And I remember her crying and fretting over that. I said, oh, he'll be okay. He's not going to... And, and I mean, she's just a sweet young girl, a young mom, husband, a young wife, and she, she didn't realize, and she did not know what you can do with cast iron, how you can bring those puppies back to life. But when she, I remember her telling Grandpa that, and I remember him. His first response was a smile and a sweet laughter, not a condes, condescending laugh, but a sweet laughter. He said, "Oh, honey, that's all right. I can fix that." And I remember they cried and they hugged, and he took it and did the process of salt and everything, fixed it all up. It was back to normal. I was eating fried potatoes in no time. <laughs> but what I, but I, what I still remember that was thirty over thirty years ago. I still remember his response as a sweet grandpa, really, in this sense. That's, that's what God is. When we come to him with a broken and a contrite spirit, he'll in no wise cast us out. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He's a forgiving father. That's what he does. Somebody say amen to that. He heals he heals our emotions. He heals our marriages. He heals our relationships. He heals our minds. In fact, He can heal you completely. Amen? He can do that. And then He, he satisfies us. It was Blaise Pascal, a mathematician, a, a philosopher from the 1600s, and he's often quoted by saying, there is a there is a God-shaped vacuum in the heart of every person that cannot be filled by any created thing but God, the Creator. When the void of a father is apparent in the life of a child, my, son, my son-in-law, who's a pediatrician, can attest to this. When, when, a, when a child between the ages of one and five do not have a father, there is a void that's created there, if not filled, that will be filled by something, uh, an, an opinion or an attitude or, or an, an influence. Um, 
and, and, but that's that critical piece of, of, of life where a child needs to have a father. And when, when that void is there, nothing can fill that void. Not even a church, not even a, a teacher or a pastor can fill that void. That void can only be filled by a father. And if that's not done by an earthly father, hear me and hear me clearly and forget everything else I said. Hear this. There is a heavenly father. Amen? that can fill the void of every need of every heart. And I'm so glad of that. This is what He does. He forgives, He heals, and He satisfies. That's what this everlasting Father does. One more thing, and one more piece of this I want us to grasp, and that is what He desires. What does He desire for us? What does He desire in us? What does He desire in our lives? 1 Chronicles chapter 28 and verse 6, God is speaking about Solomon here. And he says, now he said to me, it is your, it's your son, Solomon, who, your son Solomon who shall build, he's talking to David, who will build my house and my courts for I have chosen him to be my son and I will be his father. Echoed in 2 Samuel 7, 14. I will be his father and he shall be my son. If he commits iniquity, I will chasten him, chasten him with the rod of men and with the blows of the sons of men. It's, it's like the anticipation, we talk about this in staff, it's like the anticipation that a, that a father has. The picture in Luke 15 is of the father and the prodigal son and how that the prodigal son goes away and there's many lessons to be learned, many truths to be gleaned from that amazing story. But one thing that stands out to me as I consider our heavenly father today, our everlasting father today, is that as the son realized his need and came back home, when he was afar off, the father saw him. He must have been looking. He must have been gazing in the direction that he left. And I believe with all of my heart today that God from heaven is looking in your direction. He's looking at you with your needs and your situation and where you are and what's happening in your life. And he cares just as much. And he wants you to be his son or daughter. He wants you to experience that. He wants to to hear from us. He desires to hear from us. In fact, when the disciples said, how do we pray? You know what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 9? In this manner, therefore, pray, our Father, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. That's, that's, That's the word, again, it's the word Abba. We don't use that word. We don't, it's not in our vocabulary. It's really not in our understanding. Abba, Daddy. It's a sweet word. It's a term of endearment. It's, it's a darling word. So we're to call Him Daddy. And that's not natural for us. But what happens is when you come to faith in Christ, as Paul said to the church at Galatia, because your sons... Now, that's, that's a, that's a gen, non-gender specific term there. It's not just the, the, the male. It's, it's male and female. Now, because you are sons or children of God, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Therefore, you're no longer a slave but a son. If a son, then an heir of God through Christ. You see, what happens when you become a believer in Jesus Christ, when you have a relationship with the God of heaven, He is your wonderful counselor. He gives you that incredible advice that no one else can give. He is your mighty God that fights your battles for you and and defends you in every way. And He is your everlasting Father, your Abba, your Daddy. And you don't feel that way. You don't have that intimate feeling until you're born again and then as Paul said the spirit of his son puts in your hearts the desire not to cry out hey boss or hey you up there or hey some power in the universe no he's your dad your daddy your papa your 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 friend in a way that only a father can be that's this everlasting father God programs that in us. It's not natural to everyone else outside of the realm of faith in God. He's just a force. To many, He's just the Creator. But He's more than that. He wants to be our 
everlasting Father. Somebody say amen. What a wonderful God we serve. Not only that, an heir. You know what that means? It means you're in the will. (laughs) You're in the will. Your name's written down there. He desires, he wants to hear from us, but he wants to father us. He wants to father us. Proverbs 3.12, for whom the Lord loves, he corrects just as a father the son whom, in whom he delights. The writer to, to, the, to the Hebrews said it this way. It's a little more in detail, but I want you to hear the purpose behind it. And you, and you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as sons. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you're rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son who he receives. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? But if you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, then you're illegitimate. You're not a son. You're not a child of God. Furthermore, we have had human fathers who corrected us and we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? For they indeed for a few days chastened us as seemed best to them. But he, hear this, for our profit that we may be partakers of his holiness. That we may be in an intimate relationship with him. He chastens us to pull us close, to draw us to him, to his truth. No chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. You probably will have trouble believing this, but in my day, I was chastened a time or two. I was back when there was a board paddle yardsticks, switches, hands. <laughs> My dad didn't just wave with his hand or write with his hand. He applied. Anyway, um, you understand what I'm saying. Because he loved me. Because he loved me. I needed it. I deserved it. And it was a loving thing. Interesting, I came across a study by Jeffrey Rosenberg and W. Bradford Wilcox and they were, they were looking at the influence of fathers, and they found that the most important aspects of fatherhood, they listed seven, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time here quickly run through and running through these, but, but listen to some of the things that they talk, talk about being positive, incredibly positive, and most important as fathers. Number one, fostering a positive relationship with mom. Dads, the greatest gift you can give your kids is love their mom. Amen. I got one in my pocket. Amen. (laughs) Secondly, spending time with children. Number three, nurturing children. That's, that's, That's our responsibility as parents. Amen. Uh, discipline disciplining children appropriately. It's okay to tell them no. It's okay to not let them have their way. (laughs) Amen. Uh, serving as a guide to the outside world. It's a big world, a big world out there. They're going to be in it someday. And if we don't show them how to, how to do that, they're going to learn it somewhere else. Protecting and providing, and then serving as a positive role model. Incredibly important. And what's interesting about what they wrote and what I gleaned from, from them was fathers may not excel in all seven of these dimensions, but fathers who do well in most of them serve their children and families well. And over 90% of the children who experience that have a positive and successful future. Doesn't mean that we're going to like it. Doesn't mean that things are always going to go our way. And sometimes we base our understanding of who God is and what He does by how things go in our life. But when you have a relationship with your Father in heaven, you understand that that all things work together for good to those who love the Lord. We understand that it's not always going to go my way, and I might not always get what I want, but He is still a loving Father, an everlasting Father. You perhaps don't know this name. You might know his book, uh, Nabel Karishi. Uh, wrote the book a few years ago, Seeking Allah and Finding Jesus. Great book. If you're into apologetics, you may know his name. He has uh, worked with 
Ravi Zacharias Ministries, and man, just articulate in expressing faith and defending faith. He uh, is a doctor as an MD. He's also uh, has an MA in apologetics from Biola University, an MA from Duke, a master in philosophy from Oxford, and working on his doctorate. Only in his 30s, in his 30s, married and a child. Last year, at the, about the same time, a year ago, he gave the commencement speech at Biola University. And uh, speaking there, he shared, uh, what, what, this was actually shared for him, but he spoke to this very issue because earlier in the year last year, in August, he posted on Facebook, he said, this is an announcement that I never expected to make, but God, listen to this, hear his heart. But God in his infinite sovereign wisdom has chosen me for this refreshing. And I pray he will be glorified through my body and my spirit. And then he went on to unpack that he had been diagnosed with stomach cancer the age of, 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 in his early 30s. And so he gives this speech. That was in August. He gives the speech in December. And in the speech, in the graduation speech at Biola, he shared with the, the graduates, he said, I've only got a a 4% chance of being here five years from now. He said it looks very grim. The, the prognosis is quite grim. And then with, with, with tears in his eyes and a crack in his voice, he said this. He said, I want to see my daughter graduate. I want to see her graduate. But if I don't, he said, I know that my God is a good and loving and caring heavenly Father. On Saturday, September the 17th, 2017, Nabil Karishi died and went on to be with Jesus. It says in his obituary, he entered into the joy of his master, Jesus Christ, after enduring a year-long battle with cancer. I believe cancer is, is uh, it's not from God. It's because of sin entering into the world. But what I want us to see here is that he, along with us, can see that in the midst of the most horrible of circumstances, there is a God, there is a Heavenly Father who loves us and cares for us. And that's the relationship, whether things go good or they go bad, whether things are right or they're wrong. We have a relationship with our Heavenly Father that says, I know that regardless, you love me and I love you. Abba, Daddy, you're close, and I love you. A while back, I was in my office at home, and uh, my daughter, who, who serves at a pretty good-sized church in southern Ohio, she directs all of their small groups. She came to my office, and I'm, I had a cup of coffee. She brought up a cup of coffee. Might have brought me one. I don't remember. But there we sat, drinking coffee. She's over in a nice leather chair in the corner of my office. I'm sitting behind my desk. I was doing something when she walked in. And she, she just begins to sit and talk to me about ministry. She's experiencing ministry. Boy, that was fun. <laughs> and and she's, she's dealing with whatever she's dealing with. But there we were having this conversation. It wasn't about basketball. It wasn't about, it wasn't about boys or even raising children. It was just an adult conversation. And that struck me, that relationship, that one-on-one -on -one between a dad and a child. And I think, no, I, I know. That's what God wants with us. Between a father and his children. A loving, sweet relationship that's just there. It's what he desires. It's what he wants. It's what he longs for. I have an earthly father. I have had a number of spiritual fathers in my life. But, but none of them are like my everlasting father.